your time, the beginning by thanking Professor uh, Saskas and the Institute for uh, hosting me today, and uh, and the Italian for uh, the Lithuanian Foreign Ministry for facilitating this uh, uh, this event today. Um, and I, I really look forward to uh, sharing some thoughts with you and having maybe a little bit of a discussion at the end uh, on the issues that you might consider relevant from your from your perspective. And what I would like to do is to start from uh, uh, a point that our uh, moderator made earlier, uh, which is about the OSC being perceived as a kind of a talking shop and not, not doing enough. Uh, so I hope in the course of this, uh, of this presentation to be able to convince you that uh, uh, we're not really talking about a talking shop. Uh, when, when you uh, look at dialogue and negotiation, uh, that's much more than just uh, sitting down and, and, and having a chat. Uh, when you bring around the table uh, countries that have uh, uh, a, a complicated political agenda and, uh, and uh, issues there that need solving for the benefit of, of the whole international community, for the whole regional community, uh, that's not simply being a talking shop, it's much more. It's really uh, working to try to prevent uh, uh, situations that might affect seriously uh, the security of everybody. And the OSC is not only uh, um, uh, about dialogue and about promoting this, this kind of relationship, it's, it's also about supporting uh, uh, its own member states in making progress on the issues that are uh, on the core of the OSC agenda. And therefore we have the missions on the ground and, and project activities can, can. Let me start in, in, uh, in telling you a bit uh, uh, where we are in terms of uh, the agenda of the OSC today, um, uh, we're referring back to the Astana Summit, a summit that took place uh, uh, 10 years after, the, or 12 years after the, the, the previous one in Istanbul in 99. Um, uh, in, in a way, uh, showing how uh, the agenda of uh, the last decade uh, really complicated the way in which uh, the OSC had to operate and to adjust uh, to the new situation to the point that uh, it took quite an effort and it took uh, a leadership of, a, of a, an important member state of the OSC, uh, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, in many ways a novelty for the OSC. Uh, uh, it was the first former Soviet state uh, that had the chairmanship, it was the first Central Asian state uh, that, had, uh, that had the chairmanship uh, of the OSC, and it was successful also in helping us uh, uh, raise the profile of the organization, putting it back uh, uh, better, uh, in a more visible manner, on the agenda of the international community. And, and the challenge of, the, of this year uh, for the World well, Lithuanian uh, uh, Chairmanship is following the Astana Summit to uh, um, uh, deliver a number of uh, uh, very concrete, uh, very practical results that uh, uh, are fully in line with the directions that our state, uh, heads of state and government uh, gave, us, gave us last year. Um, one important point in the Astana um, uh, uh, Summit uh, uh, messages um, is uh, a, a vision that is presented in a slightly new way. A vision of a free, democratic, common, and I'm quoting from the text, the common and invisible Euro-Atlantic and Eurasian security community, stretching from Vancouver to Vladivostok, and rooted in a great principle, shared commitments, and common goals. Now, uh, looking at the OSC as a security community, I think it's uh, innovative in a way, uh, it's, it's a more modern way of interpreting what the um, Helsinki spirit was. Um, it's a community that is based on a um, set of commonly shared values, principles, of commitments that are being reaffirmed in a new context, uh, but, uh, but uh, in a situation where all countries say, no matter how things have evolved, uh, from the time of, uh, of Helsinki until today, we still stick to those commitments, to those principles, because they are still relevant for all of us today. And this recommitment, I think, is uh, uh, is an important uh, an important factor. Uh, 
what is the contribution that the OSC gives in, still in, in, in strategic terms? And one question sometimes comes up in my discussions with students, of course, uh, for instance, is, is uh, how does the OSC, in, in a rather crowded environment of uh, uh, international organizations and regional organizations in Europe, how does it distinguish itself and what is the added value? Now, uh, if, if you compare it with NATO or with the European Union, uh, the OSC clearly uh, is not an organization that is driven by a strong core and shared political agenda. In fact, it's a broad forum where you have a number of players that have different political agendas, but that share those principles and commitments we are talking about earlier. So they are committed to confronting their agendas and to try to resolve the problems that they have um, on the basis of those uh, shared commitments. And I think this is, this is an important... Uh, so the OSCE is a framework, and it's a very relevant framework in, in uh, geopolitical and geostrategic terms. Exactly because, as we said, it includes a, a transatlantic dimension, it, it includes the Eurasian dimension, and now, we, more and more, it looks also at a new dimension that is emerging, which is the kind of euro mediterranean uh, dimension with the Arab Spring and the new challenges, uh, looking at the fact that we have a number of partners of the OSCE on the other side of the, of the Mediterranean. And looking also at Afghanistan as, uh, as an area which is very relevant for the OSCE security because of our, uh, our activity in, in Central Asia. So we're moving uh, towards uh, a world that is more globalized, where threats are no, uh, no longer necessarily identifiable in the region, uh, and where we need to develop new tools to address them. Uh, and this is what, what has happened over the last uh, 20 years. So coming from a situation where we had a kind of east-west approach, uh, where the logic was a logic of security based on a zero-sum game, uh, we really moved along from there uh, after the end of the Cold War dealing with the uh, transition phases, democratic transition, but also security transition in many ways, uh, dealing with situations of uh, the conflicts and how to uh, address conflicts within states or between states, uh, and developing new tools to address that, adding these new tools to the toolbox that pre-existed, that remained relevant. And then in the new decade, after, after Istanbul, after 99, having to deal with the post-September 11 world, the real global uh, set of challenges, where the OSCE also changed slightly more of operation, where at some point uh, um, Russians, the Europeans, the Americans uh, uh, really uh, found out that their prior priorities were in fact coinciding. There was a common interest in fighting terrorism. Uh, there was a common interest in making sure that borders are, are secure and properly managed. Uh, uh, there was a common interest in fighting organized crime, corruption, in, uh, in fighting uh, those factors that do affect, uh, transnationally, do affect the security of its, uh, of its member states. And uh, so the OSC, as a flexible organization, has adapted itself to develop tools to address progressively uh, these new sets of challenges, uh, but in a way that takes into account the fact also that there are other organizations involved. And that's also one other element that has developed over time, uh, that is the, the close uh, or closer interaction with other actors, the United Nations first of all, um, uh, the European Union, NATO, the CSTO, and what have you, but also the RP. And, and other actors that are operating on the, uh, on the fringes, if you want, or, or the Organization for, uh, for Islamic Cooperation, um, that are operating in areas that are relevant for the OSCE, with whom the OSCE can also uh, uh, discuss a little bit what are you doing, what can we do to uh, integrate, to compensate, uh, to uh, complement uh, what you are already doing without, without well, this is one of the challenges when you have more actors really make sure that the contribution of each of them is, uh, is really an active value. So uh, how does the OSC uh, operate? What does the OSC do in practice? And I wanted to uh, just to, to give you an example and uh, as it was pointed out, I'm, I'm a relatively recent acquisition to the organization myself. 
I wanted to run through my agenda in the last couple of weeks just to show to you what I've been doing and, and what are the issues as they come up that I've been doing in support of the chairmanship, of course. And the chairmanship is involved in all of these, in, in all of these things and many more, uh, obviously. So, um, from, from the beginning of September, um, one of the first visits I made was, was a trip to Cairo. A trip to Cairo to uh, uh, make contact, uh, upon his invitation, I have to say, with the new Secretary General of the Arab League. And uh, to discuss the interaction between the two organizations. The interaction, which I found out, is already well developed, but uh, as I also discovered, an interaction that is very much of interest to the Arab League. And in fact, the Secretary General uh, uh, told me it was a very warm meeting, and, and he told me we want to uh, uh, develop more our relationship. We want to look at how you in the OSC are dealing with certain things. We want to operationalize our activities a bit more. And we want also to uh, better interact with you directly. And, uh, and so he signaled to me that he wanted to be invited uh, uh, as his predecessor had been at some point to the permanent council in Vienna. Now the Lithuanian chairmanship is looking into that. Really also there um, trying to help us better understand those developments that take place in, uh, in, uh, in a region that is, is close to us, but where we have many partners. And, and, uh, and, and be able to, to uh, operate more, uh, more efficiently. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, during this trip, I visited uh, obviously the Egyptian uh, um, friends uh, and uh, discussed a little bit how in practice we could help. And they were telling me how much they appreciated the fact that uh, a group of uh, members from uh, uh, some NGOs of theirs had been invited by Yodir for a training or election observation. And of course, this, this relationship with partner countries have to proceed with full respect uh, for the status. They are not members of the organization, so we can't impose on them the principles and commitments they apply to the member states of the OSC. But they look at us with interest, and so we can help them uh, uh, gently in a certain way, but we can help them develop their own tools based on our own experiences, on our own expertise, on our own best, uh, best practices. Um, when I came back to Vienna, the Defense Minister of Kazakhstan was there. Uh, Kazakhstan is the chair of the Forum for, Extended, for, Extended, for uh, Security Cooperation, which is one of the key bodies uh, in the OSC to deal with the political, strictly <coughs> political military security uh, in, uh, set of issues. And uh, he came to open uh, the, uh, the session of the, of the forum. I intervened also myself to also to give the support of the Secretariat and, and for the occasion also the Director General of uh, the UN Office in Geneva was there, the new uh, uh, Director of the Kazakh uh, National Foreign for Minister and, uh, and he was there to add his weight also and to uh, bring in the perspective of the UN in the spirit that was, say, I was mentioning earlier these important connections, what we do has to uh, take into account the larger agenda and has to be uh, seen also as support to uh, the larger UN uh, uh, principles and, and policies. And, and certainly that is, uh, that is something that I myself, coming from the UN job, uh, I discussed this with Ban Ki-moon before leaving and I said we want really, and tell us please, Secretary General, where you think an organization like DRC can be. Uh, uh, best support uh, the implementation of the UN agenda uh, at, the regional, at the regional level. Uh, after that, I traveled to Rome. Uh, there was a, a, a conference uh, on preventing and responding to hate incidents and crimes against Christians. And there are, this uh, is a set of initiatives that has to be very balanced because there are three conferences, one on uh, Christians, one on Muslims, and one on uh, the Jewish. And, uh, and I think it's important to uh, um, uh, uh, give the necessary prominence uh, to the necessary attention to these events uh, to highlight the importance of uh, tolerance in, uh, in the modern world uh, as the society is becoming increasingly multi-ethnic. I think an important element to ensure stability but also to ensure uh, uh, the promotion of what we see as uh, uh, as uh, the key fundamental freedoms uh, and, and uh, basic human rights 
I think it's important really to have very high uh, on the agenda the attention for these, for these issues. And as I was in Rome, I paid an official visit to the Italian Republic, uh, which was a bit of a strange thing for me, of course, but the president received me, and, and then I went to the Vatican, and I saw the Secretary of State there, and discussed a little bit the agenda ahead. After that, I went to Prague, and in Prague there was the Economic Forum, because the OSC is, uh, uh, has a broad security agenda that is based on, on these dimensions, <coughs> the political military dimension, uh, we, we, we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, uh, which is now expanding to include the global challenges, so the security, the larger approaches to dealing with security issues such as terrorism, uh, policing, trafficking, etc. Uh, the, econo the economic basket uh, of the USC, which has developed in a full fledged dimension, that covers also uh, environmental aspects, uh, and so I was there for the opening of the conference uh, uh, to underline also there the importance that we attach to uh, investing very much. Uh, in, in this dimension, in a way that is still focused very much on security. And in fact, uh, the Lieutenant Chairmanship now is uh, very interested, very successful in pushing uh, up the, the, the agenda of the organization the theme of uh, uh, energy security, which is uh, very, very relevant today. And it's an area where the USC can give its contribution, not obviously the only actor there, uh, but certainly one that can help keeping the issue high on the agenda, on the agenda of the organization, on the agenda of the international community, of the regional community in Europe. And of course, we in Prague had a, a very uh, good cordial meeting with uh, uh, the foreign minister there, and, uh, and looking at the presence of the USC, because we have an office in Prague, and allowed the best use to use it. After that, I went to Kiev, uh, Ukraine. Ukraine is going to be uh, uh, to have the chairmanship of the organization in uh, 2012, 2013. Uh, so they will, next year they will be already in the Troika, they will be chairing the Mediterranean Contact Group, they will start having operational, uh, an operational role uh, in, the, uh, in the organization. And of course, being here in this period, uh, you have to also touch on some, uh, more sensitive, some of the more sensitive issues. And uh, uh, like uh, you know, trials to uh, keep figures in the opposition, and uh, that was also something that figured uh, in the discussion that made the whole process uh, slightly more, uh, how can I say, delicate to, uh, to handle. Uh, and then now, as you see, I'm, I'm here in Vilnius, and I, had, uh, uh, I have to say a number of very fruitful high level meetings here and preparing for the, for the ministerial. And I'm traveling now to New York, there's a General Assembly, the USC is an observer at the Assembly, but as such we have a seat in there and it's important that we are present also to advance this issue of interaction and uh, <coughs> an excellent opportunity for bilaterals. So we'll have a, a structured meeting, it's called 2 plus 2 in the Council of Europe. There will be a ministerial troika of the OSC and a number of other events. Uh, so also, also there will be, and then, uh, and then down the line, other visits and, and, and trips. But it wasn't just me acting in this period. I was covering a number, a number of things. And at the same time of year, I was visiting Kazakh human rights uh, uh, activists uh, in, uh, in prison. And the director of the uh, uh, traveled to Moscow to discuss the issue of observing uh, the Russian elections, uh, the, the elections of the state Duma. Uh, Odir should come up soon uh, with a report on, uh, uh, on trial monitoring uh, mission in Belarus. Um, uh, one of my key colleagues traveled to Kyrgyzstan as a special representative of, uh, uh, of the chair, uh, along with a special representative of uh, uh, the United Nations and one for the European Union, uh, uh, to jointly pass uh, messages of support to uh, the uh, election process and looking now at uh, uh, the uh, observation of the elections and looking at continuing an important initiative on the ground, which is the uh, Community Security Initiative. It's an, uh, an initiative aimed at uh, um, uh, supporting and improving the standards of operation of the police through community policing tools uh, in a way that uh, increases the awareness and the ability of police to operate in situations where there are uh, minority issues, where uh, Policing needs really to be developed uh, to avoid that uh, uh, just a police operation could create this. 
So these are some examples. And of course, the, we have an High Commissioner for National Minorities who have its own uh, calendar of activities and the freedom of the media representative who keeps working on, uh, uh, on uh, a number of issues and I've seen initiatives uh, from, from her recently. The list is very long and I could continue explaining to this, but one of the points I wanted to convey is that very uh, rarely, if, if, uh, if at all, you will see any of these things on the headlines of the newspapers. And, and why not? Uh, this is because the, the, uh, the approach we have is, is, uh, is a low-key approach. Conflict prevention doesn't hit the headlines of the newspapers. Um, it is very difficult to send to the public, in fact. Um, if, you, if you work quietly discussing with leaders, with the society, with those sides involved, uh, to try to prevent the crisis, and you quietly manage to prevent it, you can't go out and, and say, yeah, I've done it. Because, well, first of all, uh, it's not, uh, you're not even sure whether you're the one who in the end pulled it out, or you're one of the many, or whether this would have happened anyhow, or, or who would have happened anyhow. Uh, it's, it's not uh, what the media look for. The media, like the uh, crisis management side, where you see the tank going down the road and the troops and the, uh, and the things, and uh, selling conflict prevention is, is in a way a frustrating, a frustrating operation. But then conflict prevention is good. As they say, uh, one, uh, one ounce of conflict prevention can save uh, a pound of, uh, of uh, crisis management. In fact, it's, it's much cheaper to invest in conflict prevention, and very often it does uh, uh, really avoid the problem of having uh, to, to sit there to manage you know, the crisis or to deal with very costly uh, post-conflict rehabilitation processes. And, and, and this is something that the OSC can do, can do very well. Uh, and the UN uh, is in fact encouraging us to continue down the path, and they're looking also at how we are doing things and they are strengthening themselves, their mediation support capacities, uh, to operate more in a conflict prevention mode compared to the past, uh, uh, more classic approach to, uh, to peacekeeping. And, uh, uh, and that's why the OSC, which is, as I described it, a, a, a flexible organization that adjusts easily to those situations, is also cheap because investing in conflict prevention doesn't really cost very much. Um, something that I made, a point I made to, uh, to uh, the OSC constituency when I started, and we started immediately having a budget discussion, and uh, I presented some, uh, some ideas when we formed the secretary, and the first question was how much would it cost? And they, uh, I was telling them, well, what, what's the issue? And, uh, apart from the fact that I will try to do it in a way that is cost neutral, so you won't have to pay extra. But, uh, but look at the budget in itself, and take some distance. Uh, when I went, my previous job was in Kosovo, I was head of the UN peacekeeping operation called UNIT there in Kosovo. Uh, when I started, and, and two of the UNIT pillars, I would have to add, had their own financing, which was not uh, a UN. Uh, pillar 4, uh, the economic pillar, was financed by the Europeans, and Pillar 3, the USC, was financed by the USC. So the rest of the operation was on the UN budget. The management and, uh, and the, uh, the rule of law and the civil administration. The budget of that part of the mission was $220 million when I started, so higher than the OSC budget. And if you think one moment, the OSC budget includes the budget of the Secretariat, which is you know, a reasonably large and, uh, and reasonably equipped Secretariat. It includes the institutions, OPE in Warsaw, the Office in Prague, the High Commissioner in The Hague, the Representative of Freedom of the Media in Vienna. It includes 17 field missions in uh, Southeast Europe, in Kosovo. The, the, in fact, when I finished and I configured and made much more of the UN mission, the OSC was much bigger than the UN. And, uh, and uh, large missions like, like Kosovo and, uh, and Bosnia, but also Albania and, uh, and the Fyrom and, uh, and, and Serbia. Missions in, in uh, Eastern Europe, missions in the Caucasus, uh, five centers in Central Asia. So it is a pretty spread out uh, organization with a strong presence on the ground and activities also financed in the budget. Obviously we also have some budgetary activities that come on top of that, but that's voluntary contributions for individual states. But when you look at the, at the core budget, 
that budget is smaller than the budget of, a, of an average UN, UN operation. So it is, it, is a, it is a good investment if you believe in what, uh, in, in what you're doing. Now, two words on, uh, on the meaning of being the chairmanship of the OSC, because the chairmanship of the OSC uh, is uh, the, the political engine, if you want, of, uh, of the operation. And my job is primarily to support uh, the chairmanship and to uh, uh, administer the machinery and to make sure that the machinery delivers, also in terms of implementation, uh, what the chairmanship uh, uh, intends to do and support, support obviously, the chairmanship also from a more, a more political perspective. But, but certainly, leading, leading the chairmanship uh, is, uh, is a huge responsibility. And uh, it's a responsibility that is not taken up lightly. In fact, we are not discussing these days, looking down the line, who are going to be the new, uh, the new chairs. And I've seen, I was jokingly uh, uh, telling a colleague the other day, I've seen a few examples of chairmanship, where the chairman in office and his collaborators were heavily engaged, working you know, morning to evening uh, through really uh, a very intense schedule through this chairmanship. And I heard from quite a few of them who was the guy who volunteered for our country to chair the organization. And it's one of the rules is that it's usually never the same. There's somebody who, who offers and volunteers, and then somebody else has to do it because people move on as always. <laughs> And that's, that's a, funny, a funny angle I've seen, I've seen in the organization. But, but there is, it is a, a, it's a sign that's really burdensome. It's, it's a really heavy task. And, and I have to say, uh, we, we uh, have to, uh, uh, to acknowledge the, the excellent work that uh, the Lithuanian Chairmanship has, uh, has done, not only for coming to a very successful solution of the process of appointment of the new Secretary General, which I'm very grateful to personally, but also in line, in line with the, the whole agenda of the organization and preparing uh, for Vilnius um, uh, Ministerial with a, an agenda that I personally consider a very pragmatic and very realistic one. So now the challenge, of course, is to make it happen through the obstacles, also at the political level that we fight for now and uh, and Vilnius. Uh, but this is not done uh, lightly, because to go through that, you need to have discussions and negotiations, again, to the talk shop, uh, the talk shop perception, uh, with the other 55, and you need consensus. <coughs> and, and that sometimes is difficult and frustrating. There are those who say, the president of the parliamentary assembly, for one, is arguing personally that maybe we should get away with the consensus rule. And uh, I, I disagree with him, very, very frankly, of course. But uh, I personally consider that consensus, no matter how frustrating it is, is one of the strengths of the organization. Because consensus empowers everybody. Everybody feels he has a little power. There's no club of the, yes, of course, there are, there are, there are the, the stronger countries who have a stronger say who, uh, who, who, who uh, you know, put down their fist and say never. But also the little ones can do the same if the issue is vital for them. And the OSC is one of those organizations where they can do it. And they can get the big guys frustrated. Saying, if you don't solve that problem, my, you don't go anywhere. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, because then the agenda point for the little country goes high up and is visible for everybody. And uh, they can make a point in this organization that they are unable to make in others. Uh, uh, you know, we were talking about EU and NATO. Some of these countries are, have a different relationship with those organizations. They're kind of guests. They can't do that. They can't do it in the OSC. And that's why the OSC is, is good in that sense, and the consensus rule is good. Is good. Even though at the end the result may be less ambitious, because you have to take into account of all, the, uh, of all these elements. So now, this is the nature of the job, also from the chairmanship, to say to the various issues between now and December, and, and uh, uh, come up with a good result uh, based on, uh, on the, uh, um, uh, how can I say, political input of, uh, of uh, Astana, and building on that, and looking ahead, and focusing on issues that, uh, that are uh, important for member, member states. Working on the conflicts uh, is, is one of the issues. 
those conflicts, uh, when I was previously in the OSC, they were called frozen conflicts, now they're called protracted conflicts, I suppose that's progress. But looking at them, they don't seem to have changed very much uh, in terms of, uh, of process on the ground. Even though we are seeing some possibly encouraging signals on Moldova, and we'll have to see now how this develops between now uh, Moldova and Transnistria, between now and, uh, and the end of the year, and perhaps there will be, uh, there will be something there. Um, but, you know, the, the, being in the chairmanship, you have to take the lead on, on a large uh, uh, set, set of issues. Uh, you know, from agreeing to agendas and the topics of high level meetings, to the appointment of the top officials of the OSC, and, uh, and, and, and talking to, to everyone, the mixed journalists, uh, for instance, as met government leaders, civil society, media representatives all over the world. Uh, and they gave me a list here of uh, recent visits. Washington, Brussels, Moscow, Chisinau, Kiev, Belgrade, Podgorica, Pristina, Zagreb, Batu, Tbilisi, Yerevan, Ashkabat, Astana, Biscay, Dushanbe, Orshel, Tashkent. Moving from place to place, running a, a bit of a you know, fireman mode and, and uh, trying to extinguish fires, talking to people, keeping the situation under control, at the same time promoting the agenda of the organization. And that's why the, 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 the chairman office needs the support and needs somebody to be there also to follow up what he does, what he says, how he acts. And, uh, and then he has also the job, which is not a comfortable job, of speaking out to those countries. Countries say, yes, we do adhere to the principles and commitments. Huh? They go back and do what they want. And, and the, the job of the chair is to tell them, you are not doing what uh, you have committed yourself to do. And, and so, uh, you know, the, 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 there are statements, and you can see them on the OSC side, the statements from, uh, from the German, German in office. And, and the Lithuania's voice through him has been heard on issues concerning the situation of civil society in Belarus, uh, suicide bomb attacks in Grozny, the trial of uh, the former Prime Minister Timoshenko in Ukraine, the violence in Kosovo, the political situation in Albania, and uh, the transnational threats, 11th September, and all issues that are relevant for the agenda of the organization, which is also showing the breadth of, of its agenda, the breadth of this, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, comprehensive approach to security. And, and this also shows how much uh, the OSC interacts with all relevant actors uh, in the society to move, uh, to move forward its agenda. The OSC is not only an intergovernmental organization where uh, states uh, uh, or the representative countries sit there and discuss the way forward. Yes, that is the driving force, and that's part again of the, of the talk shop uh, model of, of the dialogue. But the OSC, from its inception and still today, it talks to the civil society, uh, gets inputs and passes inputs at different levels. You know, when I was in Kiev, I guess I saw the government, but I also had lunch with the members of the opposition. And, and all of this is factoring what, uh, in what, in what we do. I travel and talk to ministers, but I also sit down and talk to the public, to, student, to students, uh, I work with academic networks. And I think it's important for the OSC to keep this. Because the OSC is about promoting security. I think human security is very much also the center of the OSC concept of security. When we look at human rights, at uh, the dignity of the individual, it's not something indifferent, it's, it's at the core of the OSC mandate. So we work with, uh, with the people, we work with the states, but also we work at the, at the higher level, we work as a region, and we look at the common challenges of the region. So there are three levels, the, the, the level of the individual, the intergovernmental level, and the larger regional level. And, and those uh, perspectives are, are always taken into account as, uh, um, as we move forward. So I, I do realize I'm being a bit long. Uh, maybe I should, uh, I should uh, <laughs> wind up the presentation. But let me say that uh, uh, it's been for me a pleasure to, uh, to have this opportunity. It was a pleasure for me uh, to be able to have these uh, meetings in Vilnius. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to work. Sorry, now that I see, I forgot one more important element, which is the parliamentary side of things. Working with parliaments is also important. Uh, as I travel, I try to make time. I, I met uh, the Speaker of the Parliament in Ukraine, uh, and, uh, and uh, I, I try to have a parliamentary uh, um, side uh, whenever I travel because uh, 
the political side are parliaments are very much a driving force uh, in our countries. Um, uh, awareness by, by uh, members of parliaments of the issues we're dealing with is important and it helps the organization achieve uh, its, its ultimate goal. So it is good to have also a debate about the OSC in, in parliaments in the margins. And I, I really welcome the openness of the parliamentary assembly. We have a parliamentary assembly in the OSC to interacting with the, um, the executive structures and, and the chairmanship in uh, uh, also giving them support in some of the key uh, political things. I think that's, that's another important element that we need to, to tackle. So this leaves me with uh, wishing good luck to what you are so, and first of all to uh, um, the Lithuanian chairmanship. The Lithuanian chairmanship works on behalf of the whole uh, of, of OSC community and on behalf of all of us. Uh, for the Vilnius Ministerial, it's going to be, uh, uh, as usual, uh, a, a tough ride, but I'm sure we'll get there, and I'm sure uh, uh, this will uh, be a, a, a result uh, that will uh, uh, certainly uh, be a, an acknowledgement and recognition of uh, the efforts that the uh, chairmanship has put in uh, uh, throughout the year uh, for the success of the Ministerial, for the success of the event. Thank you very much.